session time and in Agri Roundup with Dr. Gulati this time, we are going to talk about the performance of the government in the last 10 years and the promises being made in manifestos for the future. Welcome to the show, Dr. Gulati. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's 10 years uh, of the Narendra Modi government. Elections are going on. Uh, how do you assess the performance of the government in the last 10 years on uh, parameters of agriculture, farmer incomes, etc.? Well, overall, right now, the mood is that uh, Indian economy is growing at 7.6% at least. It can be even higher. Uh, but agriculture for the last 10 years of Modi government is 3.6% per annum average. Compared to the Manmohan Singh government, also 3.5%. So there is hardly any change between the Manmohan Singh government or the Modi government as far as agriculture performance is concerned. There are other parameters of judging agriculture performance. Income being one, there were promises of doubling farmers' income, the real income. Uh, I think the achievement is at, at the most 40 to 50 percent of the promise. So uh, there is a big uh, strategic uh, thinking that needs to go into it and how to do it, but that has not been achieved. Uh, one more parameter and why it has not been achieved is what's happening on growth front of uh, exports, agri-exports. Agri-exports, if you look at, they were growing at 20% per annum in dollar terms during the Manmohan Singh government period, you know, UPA period, 20% per annum. That has collapsed to 1.9% per annum during the Modi period. So from 20 to less than 2%. And that shows whether agriculture is strong enough to take a market share because market access is a critical thing to lift the incomes of the farmers, especially when you are not in huge scarcity. And there are two reasons for this. One is the global prices when they were in the upswing and that was the period during uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh's uh, government. Uh, our exports went up from literally uh, 8.7 billion dollars in 2004-05 to 43.3 billion dollars in 13-14. That's more than almost a 500 percent increase over the 10-year period. Uh, but after reaching the global prices high at 13-14, then the prices started rolling down globally. So our competitive strength. Uh, was blunted and exports in fact started falling down from 43.3 billion dollars in 13-14 to they came down to 35-36 and then they recovered in the second uh, period of uh, Mr. Modi. Uh, it is recovering, it has reached about 48.9 billion dollars in 23-24, the data that has come just last week. So, you know, the growth rate has collapsed and that shows a pressure. Now, the other reason behind uh, falling growth rate is the very tight export policy. They are containing and putting, uh, you know, they started off with wheat in 2022, 13th of May actually. And uh, then uh, they started with uh, sugar controls, then on uh, rice, so there was a panic uh, created on that, uh, rice export restrictions and lately even onion was, uh, uh, you know, uh, exports were banned. Uh, just two days before uh, uh, the elections uh, in Maharashtra, uh, they announced that we are lifting the ban on exports of onions, but they put a condition that uh, the minimum export price will be $550 per ton and on top of that there will be 40% uh, export duty. That means onion cannot be exported at a price below at least rupees 65 a kg. The farmers are selling in Lassangon, the biggest market, at 13, 14, 15 rupees a kg and they are not recovering their costs. So putting such a high export price 
uh, is actually not doing any favor to the farmers. And that's how the incomes of the farmers get suppressed. The political economy is they want to favor the consumers because prices should not go up, especially at the election time. So consumers will start drum beating the onions. And you know, uh, during Vajpayee government, one of his <laughs> governments fell actually on onion prices. So they don't want to, uh, you know, go in that direction and they want to control. So this thing that controlling the prices for the consumers implicitly acts as an anti-farmer policy because it doesn't allow the farmers to lift. But overall, when you look at the CPI inflation during the Modi period, it is less compared to the Manmohan Singh period. Look at how opposition is saying, oh, high inflation, high, they forgot what was the inflation rate during their time. So their inflation rate of 10 years was more than 8% per annum and Modi is about 5.5% uh, per annum. So overall, it's a mixed bag. <laughs> um, um, Dr. Gulati, since you are speaking about farmer exports, so if I understand correctly, you're saying that farm sector imports were doing very well during the Manmohan Singh uh, period, exports. almost booming. Uh, yeah, exports no, were booming. Mm -hmm. uh, Primarily because uh, that government was allowing farmers to take advantage of high international prices mm -hmm. and probably that was spilling over into the domestic economy causing inflation in domestic agri markets yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, it's, a, it's a choice, it's a political choice that the current government has made mm -hmm. to uh, deny uh, farmers uh, international income opportunities in order to protect the domestic consumers. Um, before uh, you know, we move on to the next question, uh, I, I can't resist asking you, uh, don't you think, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if the subsidies, the I know it's a constitutional uh, provision, but if uh, agri incomes were, were to be uh, included in uh, the uh, incomes on which agriculture uh, uh, income taxes uh, uh, collected, uh, then this political economy question will become easier because uh, uh, you know we don't see this in any other sector other than agriculture that the producers denied opportunity to make incomes and profits in order to protect the. Consumers, as much as we do see it in the agri sector. You have to remember two things before we talk of income tax on farmers. Uh, if you are suppressing their prices and not allowing them to get the best price in the world, you are implicitly taxing them through trade policy. Not an income tax policy, but this is an implicit tax and the resources are being shifted from the farmers to the consumers. So instead of government putting a direct help to the consumers to compensate them for high inflation, only the vulnerable section should be protected. Why everyone, you and me, should be protected, right? We are paying market prices for every other commodity. So the issue is the policymaker is walking a very tight rope. He has to balance the interest of the farmer, but also has to balance the interest of the consumer. So to protect the consumer, they apply the brakes on the prices of farmers and then to ensure that they are not revolting, they give them some subsidies, uh, they give them some minimum support prices and so on and so forth. But overall, when you look at it, we did a 20 year analysis. Indian agriculture has been implicitly net taxed even after including the fertilizer subsidy, power subsidy and so on and so forth. So the taxation element, the brake element is much bigger than the accelerator element in terms of subsidies. And it's also, at least the impression I get, a bit discretionary and arbitrary as compared to other sectors where at least you know what tax you're going to have to pay. Here, at the drop of a hat, uh, with, in an unpredictable way, with That's a lot right. of flip-flops. Everybody has to pay in a way those even two hectare wallas who could have been, you know, bypassed by the income tax otherwise because their incomes are very low. So they would not be paying even income tax if you go by that stratification. But now through the trade policy tax that you're putting, you're suppressing their prices. So even they are paying. Big farmers in any case are paying because they have large surpluses. So everybody is paying. If you move from trade policy taxes to income tax, then only the very rich 
you know, 10 hectares or 8 hectares, 7 hectares, yes, they have good incomes, but they are very small in number as in the other sector. Out of total of 144 uh, uh, crore people, uh, you know, uh, how, how many people are uh, uh, paying income tax? Uh, the real tax is uh, being paid by 5, 6 uh, crores. So, that's the story. So, in farming community also, the rich people are only 3%, 4%, 5%. So farmers are unlikely to be uh, very uh, happy. What about consumers? Consumers are probably well protected. You know, remember that for consumers, prices are always high. And for farmers, prices are always low. So the complaints will be on both hands. And the politics is an art of managing this, uh, you know, unsatisfactory uh, behavior on both hands. How do you deal with it? Farmer is selling onion at 15 rupees today. In Delhi market, Noida market, you can get onion at 30 to 40 rupees a kg. That's the retail price. Farmer is unhappy because his cost is increasing and he's not recovering his cost. And consumer says anything beyond 25 rupees is very high, I can't pay. So 40, 50, the moment you open up exports, the farmer price will go to 30 rupees, export price will be 60 rupees or 50 rupees and Delhi market price will come to 60 rupees, 70 rupees and then every consumer is upset with the government. That's where the dilemma of the policy maker is. Uh, on the other parameter of sustainability, uh, how, how has the performance of the last 10 years been? Yeah, that we have to be very careful about because as we go in the future, the biggest challenge is going to be climate change and extreme weather events. You look at 2023-24 last year, we had a bit of El Nino and in the middle of the rains, rainy season, for three weeks literally rains disappeared. The agriculture GDP growth fell from 4.7% in 22-23 to 0.7% in 23-24, 0.7%. So this can be the huge volatility that led to a lack of demand in the rural area because they don't have the income and the entire FMCG sector has been crying that, you know, there is no demand, there is no demand because rural areas and nobody noted this. In a way, you know, people are all shouting about the overall GDP growth of 7.6%, 7.8% in 23-24, but nobody is talking about 0.7% in agriculture, which is engaging 45.8% of the working population. There is a severe crisis, but nobody addressed that. Nobody looked at that. Is there any compensation we can give them? Is PM Kisan compensate them? That 6,000 per year was announced in 2019, the real value of that has gone down to 4,000. So you need to at least bump up that 6,000 to 8,000 or even 10,000 because it is less distortionary than uh, many of the other opposition parties are saying we will promise um, MSP legal this that. I'll, I'll come to the promises of the future. Mm -hmm. uh, the impact of uh, climate change, accelerated climate change is immediate on farmers, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know we will probably begin to take note of it on the environment uh, uh, in our typical Indian way of yeah. going, uh, noting a little, little slowly. Uh, but um, what is the performance on on uh, on that? There was you know uh, policies about neem coating, etc. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'll give you this. Uh, there are two parts of climate story on agriculture. One is the adaptation part. The other is the mitigation part. So to create a climate resilient agriculture, you need to invest first in seeds. For example, wheat, can they take more heat, heat resistant varieties of wheat? And our director of wheat research, uh, he says that last year or this year, we had put almost 80% of our area under heat resistant varieties. That's commendable. But the taste of the pudding is in eating. Even last year we had put 
you know, 60% area under heat resistant varieties, but a spike in the temperature in February can one percentage degree, one degree centigrade up, uh, you will lose 5% of wheat. That's the story. So I think a lot of agri R&D has to be done, but more has to be done on farming practices to contain the moisture. So many of the farming practices that we are doing today have to be changed. They need to be realigned. Many of the policies, fertilizer subsidy policy or other subsidies, power subsidy and so on and so forth, which are leading to ecological disaster in states like Punjab and Haryana, they need to be reoriented, realigned, given to the farmers. I'm not saying reduce these, give it to the farmer in a manner which encourages them to produce more with less of uh, damage to the planet. So soils have to be protected. Our carbon uh, content, uh, soil organic carbon uh, content, uh, which uh, the World Food Laureate uh, Ratan Lal says should be between 1.5 to 2 uh, optimally. 60% uh, of our soils are having a carbon content of less than 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So they are literally in the ICU. So you have to protect the soils. Then you have to protect the groundwater. You look at in the last uh, uh, 22 years, uh, Punjab water table has gone down by 11 meters. And it is all because of free power. And then paddy on top of that, massive depletion of uh, groundwater. And fertilizer subsidy is leading to high nitrate content, nitrous oxide in the environment. So it's an ecological disaster taking place. We have to do mitigation part along with resilience adaptation part. I think government is lagging way behind on that. And this is a thing humanity as a whole will repent and India in particular because the consequences of climate change are very uneven amongst countries and India is one of the hot spots which is going to suffer more because the temperatures here are going to go to you know people are talking two degrees but in India it can go to three to four degrees uh, centigrade high. But what about the promises for the future? Are the political parties, uh, both uh, the uh, BJP and the opposition, principal opposition party, uh, the Congress, what are they promising for uh, if they, they were to uh, return to forming government? Uh, what are they promising and what's your assessment of these promises? Are they going to meet the challenges that we've just discussed? Well, there are chapters even on climate uh, in both the parties, um, but uh, action is somewhat uh, not very clear. What are they going to do? And the priority it is towards the end. So that's not, doesn't seem to be a priority when I read the two manifestos. But one thing that stands out in the case of Congress is uh, uh, they have said, oh, we'll make MSP legal for these 23 crops. Uh, so, you know, many people have been asking oh, what will be the implication of this and is it really feasible and all that. I can only say good luck to Congress. Uh, if they can do it, um, they'll be next to God. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, that was, I was chairman of that committee and we prepared a report that uh, diversification, we are lagging behind by 20 years, if not more. And we need to get out of this MSP business. And for Punjab, there could be a separate package, Punjab, Haryana, Belt, because that's the ecological disaster we need to save. And you can assure them some sort of, uh, yes, we will buy pulses or oil seeds or maize, uh, you know, or millets uh, at an MSP. But that's not making it legal because the moment you make it legal, that means even the private sector has to pay. You cannot force, you not force. So my feeling is if this is done for 23 commodities all over the country, it is impossible as far as my understanding is concerned. If they try to do it, it will lead to a major spanner in the system because what they are saying is we will give Swaminathan committee formula that is cost C2 plus 
50% on that. That means immediately the price of these commodities will go up by at least 25%. Will the government sustain that increase in price spilling over all over the economy and then why only these 23 commodities? These 23 commodities constitute only 28% of the total agriculture value. Why not milk? Milk is bigger than rice plus wheat plus pulses plus sugar can all put together. So they will also ask, can I minimum support price? DJ? And if the supply is exceed demand, who will buy? How many commodities you can buy? Government cannot be a grocery shop. It has to regulate business. It should not be doing business. It's a disaster. Even FCI today, I would say, they're keeping rice stocks which are four times the buffer stock now. This is a huge inefficiency in public expenditure. So we need to learn out of that and find out better means to help the farmers. Rather, yes, market risk has to be minimized. But if you want to take over everything, government, let them go to Dr. Manmohan Singh and get that signature that he supports this. This report was with them when he was the Prime Minister for a number of years. Why did he not do at that time? It was discussed and I know personally from inside, it was rejected. It is impossible. Any sensible economist cannot stand by that. Okay, that's what my, I have all my heart for the farmers. But this is not the policy instrument to help them. It's a wrong instrument. Besides, you were telling me that if MSP of these uh, commodities would, would be increased by as much as 25%, mm -hmm. then all farmers will only start producing these commodities. No, no. <laughs> there is a major imbalance in the production basket that will happen. And why you are opening a Pandora's box? Why other farmers? What crime? Other farmers? Why not onion? Why not uh, okra? Why not uh, tomato, potato, everything? They are all farmers. So they will be all on stage. So you are creating a recipe for disaster of your own political power. And your own constituency. This is, you know, but politics is politics. Uh, when they are out of power, they can promise the moon. Anything. <laughs> we will see when that situation comes. Oh, you've read all the manifestos, Dr. Gulati. Is mm -hmm. any agriculture farming related uh, promise um, giving you any confidence at all in how our politicians and political parties view the sector? I don't think uh, this will go at its own pace. Three and a half percent business as usual. My fear is that climate change is going to hit us harder than all these people are thinking. Okay, or at least writing in the manifesto. Writing is one thing, but the action on the ground in terms of policies, in terms of uh, uh, funds allocation, uh, I think we are lagging behind and we will be caught. Uh, if you had two or three years of drought at a stretch, you had it. And we don't want to talk about mitigation. You know, COP28, first time in UAE, they brought agriculture into this. First time. India refused to sign that. 134 countries have signed. All, almost all uh, G20 countries, 134, including Bhutan, Bangladesh, Pakistan, China, US, everybody has signed. Australia, but India, no, we will not sign. Why? Because we will have to change our farming practices. Take that advantage to make it compatible with nature. You have damaged nature much more to save yourself. But now the nature will teach you. Unfortunately, Indian agriculture seems caught between political overconfidence and political desperation for votes. Uh, but on that note, thank you so much, Dr. Galati. Thank you very much. I hope something is learned and the political masters take uh, uh, actions that are compatible with peasants' prosperity as well as planet's basic resource endowment. Thank you for having me. Thank you.